Hello, everyone. Welcome to this week's episode. And I'm joined by potentially two of the fittest people in the paddock, the Alpha Tauri performance coaches, Michael Italiano, who's worked with Daniel Ricciardo and is currently with Yuki Sonoda, and Piri Salmella, who has worked with Daniel Kavia, Pierre Gasly, and currently with Nick DeVries. Hello to you both. G'day, Matt. Very kind introduction. <laughs> um, it's great to get you on really appreciate your time and I'm really excited for this chat because I think we're going to learn an awful lot about uh, not only what you do but we're going to get a bit more insight into into what Formula One drivers have to go through the physical demands um, on their body but Michael kick things off a performance coach what is it yeah I, I like to sum it up by just saying we um we we prepare our athletes to perform I I, I like that as like a little um, little summary, quick summary, I guess. But if you want to go into the more complex things, I think um, you know we can we can talk more about that today. But essentially, we're taking care of our drivers. We're going to every race um, to make sure that you know they're uh, they're physically and they're physically conditioned, um, also mentally, and also we you know from um, in some standpoint we look after their nutrition as well. So we're, we're there on a race weekend, I guess, to make sure that everything goes smoothly for our drivers and, and making sure that. Uh, yeah, they're all prepared, ready to go before before every session. It's pretty involved. There's a lot of elements, aren't there, aren't there to your role? Um, Piri, we're recording this on the Tuesday before the Austrian Grand Prix. So why don't you kind of take us through what this week is going to entail for, for yourself? You know, we usually we receive the schedule like the week before. So so we received our plan yesterday. So and that kind of sets the tone for the week. You know, that's that's and, and mainly for us, it's about about being on top of the schedule and, and plan and, and make sure that we know when to train, when to eat, when when to arrive at the right location, etc. So it's a, a lot about kind of managing the, the schedule and the, the, the planning itself. So it's more yeah. like on top of being on top of the schedule all the time. I'd love to have you um, responsible for my schedule. <laughs> <Sounds great. laughs> okay, we've got lots of questions in from people at home, so I'm going to try and try and intersperse some of those throughout uh, throughout this interview. But Erica would like to know, as a trainer, when do you get the most nervous? Piri, let's let's start with you. I have to say. Over the years, I get less and less nervous. You know, I, I think I think when I started ten years ago, I, I got nervous since Thursday onwards. But now, after two hundred races, I think you started to learn how to manage the emotions and 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 actually enjoy the the, the race and the, the nerve wracking race starts, etc. So I have to say, these days, I I enjoy every moment of it. Michael, yeah, what about I'm, you? I'm similar as as. The more experience you get, you become in Formula One. The, the, the more you can control your nerves. But I will say definitely, quali, like if, if you're in Q3 and, and you're really pushing, I, I think um, I was always nervous in Q3 and the race start. I, I, I still do get nervous at race starts. Quali, not so much. But yeah, race start is is probably the most nerve wracking because that's probably well, obviously because it's out of your control and a lot can happen. Perry, can you can you enjoy? the race weekend now Do, are you in a position where you you sort of look forward to it and, and and working with the drivers that's something you really you really enjoy totally because because now again like i always say experience something that you cannot buy you know this can't be bought online and 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 like i think the skill comes first and the experience then remasters the, the skill and 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 now you can you can enjoy more and have an overview of what's going on and, and you can you're not more sure about your own actions and, and, and the perception what you receive from the drivers and you see and so you feel like you're a little bit more in control of what what's act, actually happening in that space so actually I would say so yes what about yeah. you Michael yeah I think as years go on you, you tend to um, enjoy it a lot more I think when I first started there's a lot of pressure uh, and there's a lot to get yeah. used to in Formula One as well. And mm-hmm. especially when results aren't doing too well, you know, you, you do feel the pressure yeah. and, you, and you do you do have that heightened expectation. So, um, and it's, it's tough tr- trying not to get too emotionally invested, if that kind of makes sense. Because when you get too mm-hmm. emotionally invested, I think that can kind of weigh on yourself where, you know, as a coach, you need to make sure that you're on all the time and, you're, you know, you're there to be the, the sounding board and, and making sure that you're sharp and, and mentally on. So, yeah, just learning that throughout the years of just understanding, you know, the balance between being not being too emotionally invested and making sure that you're there for your role. 
Mm. Yeah, I think you gotta kind of remember that 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 it's a result-driven sport. At the same time, we are there for the athletes, so you know we gotta be there for the backbone, whatever they need to be successful in their own, you know, driving and the performance itself. So, so I think I learned to take a little bit step back and and be there for them when they need to. Yeah, it's a it's a selfless role, isn't it? When when you're working so closely for for the you know for the success of, of someone else. Um, Piri, take us back to when you started in in Formula One, and you you first came in as a as a rookie yourself, right, with Daniel Kvyat. How was that process of working with not only a rookie in Formula One, but you being a rookie yourself? I would say it was a total shock therapy. I had no clue about Formula One. <laughs> I, and I even wondered myself what I'm doing here. And, and I actually, is there something that I, I can actually help for? And, and But quite soon after, I, I realized that, that, okay, you know, human body is the same, whether it's me and you. And the same physiological principles applies. And, and with Daniel being so young, there were so many areas to improve. And, and when you start with a, with a project like a young driver, you start from the foundation. So, so that gave me that buffer to, to take time and learn what this sport is about. But I have to say that the start was hard, you know, like I had no clue about the sport because at the same time, it was never like really my target. Uh, I, I have to say, I in a way got the very lucky to get an opportunity in, in somewhat sport that I didn't even knew that really existed as a performance coach role as a performance coach role so in that respect um it was it was really interesting times michael how did you start working with daniel yeah i'd probably say a little bit of luck there matt i was a, i was a strength and conditioning coach back in perth wa and at the end of 2017 daniel uh, randomly offered me the role so uh, i was friends with daniel prior you know following his journey um, and uh, unexpectedly just woke up one day, uh, it was in November, uh, one morning, about to head, head to the gym at 6 a.m. for my first client, and, and Daniel sent me a message saying, look, I, w- I, w- I want to see if you want to consider coming on board for next year. Can, can we have a meeting when I come back to Perth in December? So, yeah, everything hit real quick. It was like a sink or swim type of scenario for me, and, and like yeah. similar to Peru, where like I was coming in with a very, very developed driver, with a lot of expectations. Um, so I was like Piru, I didn't really know much about Formula One. So I kind of sat back and was a bit of a sponge um, in that, that first year and kind of just, I let Daniel kind of lead the way in, in, in what, what worked for him. Because because at, at that time, I think he'd done six or seven years in Formula One. So he kind of had an idea what worked and what didn't work. And, and then when I wanted to start laying some principles, I, I think I, I needed a bit of time before I started making some changes. So. I remember 2018, first year, first race, Melbourne Grand Prix, home race. Uh, it was the first year of Drive to Survive and I just remember getting out of the car and there was just literally about 40 cameras and he just looked at me because you could tell I was quite flustered. I was just completely taken back and he goes, oh, don't worry, they're not all like this. <laughs> um, so I, I, I learned a lot in that first year because we had such a fantastic start to the year and then we had a really, really – uh, I guess you could say mediocre end to the year. So I learned the emotional roller coaster of Formula One very quickly. Perry, what what about Formula One when you came in? Obviously, quite fresh to the sport. What about it surprised you? What were your first impressions of, of, of the sport as a whole? As a whole, really like the dynamics. You know, it's not a traditional sports environment where where everybody's sort of performance staff. In Formula One, you have engineers, you have mechanics, you have you have different type of stakeholders. You have so the so the organization is much broader compared to other traditional sports, where all of the people are more more or less, so to say, performance staff, or very performance mindset oriented from a traditional sports mindset. So I think this was the biggest biggest surprise, and that really took me time to 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 kind of to understand that that actually that the language that I'm speaking probably doesn't translate the same way that I was expecting that it was doing before. So actually now now I need to learn a little bit how the different departments and, and how these different stakeholders fall into the same, you know, game as a whole and, and how how do I get my own message across across the board? Because 
in the end, we only have, in the end, very few people that has really have this human performance um, mindset that is really looking after the human performance side of the things. Um, most of the people are working towards the car and, and, and then the image itself of the team or, or, or the brand itself. So uh, to, to learn the dynamics, how it works, also... I have to say it's a very particular sport because you have the cockpit, you have the helmet, so you, you, you barely can't see any human action. So you can't really see how stressful actually it is. So understanding that actually what happened, what happens in the car and how stressful it is and, and you know, it's external forces that is driving the human around the circuit. So that kind of concept was very... It took me a time to understand like how it actually works and what's important. Why is why one driver is today fast? Why someone is slow today? And and, and what makes the difference? So, I would say this was a really really important time for me to learn um, about this sport because I had no motorsport background. So to actually understand what's the important because I always build my philosophy on what's the most important thing what's the second most important thing that we actually we use our time on those most important elements so so these were the the key f- pillars for me to 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 learn about this sport mm. michael how long did it take you to adapt to formula one because there are just so many like perry said there are so many stakeholders you know even in the performance realm a lot of drivers will have performance engineers as well. So you, I guess you're having to do a bit of teamwork and work with a, a pretty broad team of people to get the best out of the driver. Yeah, I, I'm going to say it probably took me a couple of years. Um, I probably still am adapting because I've just, I've been bunny hopping teams for the last five years. So I think it's my fourth <laughs> team now. So just just when you think you're comfortable, you're, uh, you're moving teams. But uh, yeah, I, I think to add to what Piru said, I think... Um, the two biggest things for me was I didn't realize how much of a, the, the car setup can actually dictate the driver's actual performance. That's one thing I, I really didn't understand until I actually got in, into Formula One and was sitting in the garage and listening to, to Daniel um, speak to his engineer. Uh, and the second was jet lag. Yeah, holy I did not realize how much jet lag is real yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as to how much it can just wear on you and, and, and your athlete. So that was something I kind of got caught out with, I think, initially, just not understanding how to, 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 I guess, combat and manage jet lag accordingly. And I got, I got sick quite a lot in the first year. And I think, you know, as a coach, if, if you're sick, you're, you're no use to your driver. So, yeah, I got, I got a little bit caught out there, not, not taking care of, care of myself enough the first year. Mm. Yeah, I have to say that the sport is so complex and that what surprised me the most. Um, you know, like you have so, so many different elements of what has an impact to the end result. You know, like as a traditional coach, you, you think that, okay, you may, if you make them stronger, faster, fitter, probably they're going to improve their performance. But Formula One itself is so complex. There's so many different, you know, elements and stakeholders that has an impact that, that understanding that the, the end game, what is actually important and, and what's less important and how us as a performance coaches, can we directly impact the performance or is it completely secondary and indirect transfers what we applying to the driver? So understanding this whole concept is, I think, was the key for me. Michael, you obviously spent many years with Daniel. You now have started working with Yuki Sonoda. I'm going to guess from the outside that they're quite different to work with. I don't know if you're going to agree with me or disagree with me, but what's it been like moving from working, you know, with a, with a friend in Daniel to now working with Yuki? Yeah, spot on, Matt. It's uh, it's very different, and and I think I think it's quite obvious. Like Yuki, Yuki's you know into his third year. He's uh, he's very raw and fresh. So there's a lot for him to learn. Where Daniel was quite established when I came on board. So. They, they, you know, very different characters, um, very different um, areas of their of their career. When I came in, essentially, so you know, I've come into Yuki where you could you could probably argue, you know, it's a bit of a make or break season for Yuki. Usually, that third or fourth year in Formula One, you got to start to start to show some improvement because um, you've always got the next new youngster knocking on the door. And with Daniel, you know, there was always expectations to always do well. Um, so yeah, v- very different. Um, 
both very equally funny in their own rights. Um, both, both, to be fair, both very much foodies. So, you know, still, still eating very well. And Yuki's always taking me to the, the best Japanese restaurants wherever we go. So I'm not complaining because I, I, I love, I love Japanese cuisine. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I, I'd probably say like, yeah, d- definitely like, d- definitely a different coaching concept for, for Yuki when it comes to, and, and to Daniel. Like with, with Daniel, you know, um, he, he already kind of established his professionalism and his maturity where with Yuki, um, I think it's pretty fair to say, and, you know, Yuki wouldn't argue with, with this, you know, he's still trying to develop his leadership skills and his maturity and, and also un- understanding himself as a person as well because he's still figuring himself out. So, um, yeah, very different dynamics that I'm currently working with. And you know what? I'm enjoying it. It's been a nice new uh, fresh role for me. We've got a question on Instagram from Eva, which is to you, Perry. How was it working with Pierre for so many years and being by his side throughout the Red Bull demotion, which obviously he was promoted from Toro Rosso to the main team and then moved back to the sister team mid, mid-season. So how, how was that process? What did he need from you throughout that time in his life? I think these are the, the moments that you kind of learn from the books. You know, this is something that you kind of be very well prepared for. Um, but it's a moment of crisis. You firstly, you want to you want to stabilize. You want to understand what's happening. Then you want to replan and then you just move on. And and I think with 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 us, we always had the mentality with with Pierre that every day is an opportunity um, and we cannot control everything. Um, no matter if it was a practice, if it was a race, if it was a whatever, every day was a competition for us in a way. So, so every day was for us opportunity, and and also throughout that experience, I think was a life turning moment for Pierre, and and I think he learned a lot, and and also kind of illustrates who he is today. Um, so, yes, it was a hard time. At the same time, it was life learning moments and, and times for him and, and I have to say very grateful for being part of it as well because I think it also taught me a lot about life this sport itself and, and, and you know how to get through the crisis I always say that you never know how strong you are before you before you touch the bottom Michael we, we've spoken about the differences between some of the drivers but are there traits that you see across all the drivers on the grid, you know, obviously we all know they're great drivers, they're, they're incredibly fast, but are there any other traits that, that all of them seem to have to, to get to the peak of, of motorsport? Yeah, I, I think I can only honestly comment on my experience with Daniel and Yuki because I don't really have, I guess, much of a deeper understanding of, of all the other drivers. But if there was, you know, if I'm to comment uh, on, a, on a, I guess, a one main characteristic between Daniel and Yuki that I kind of feel definitely can, I guess, define why they're so good. It's is their ability to focus and to get into into that that flow state. So you know, um, if if you are an athlete, everyone knows that you know getting into this flow state, this A game state where you're just in this hyper focus scenario where everything else is almost feels like your internal vision essentially. Um, that is something that I've just I found so fascinating that Daniel and Yuki can do so easily. Uh, literally, as soon as they get in the cockpit, I can I can see before they put their helmet on. I can see their their eyes tighten up. I can see their their facial expressions really really hone in, and I can I can automatically see that there's nothing else kind of matters. They're they're, they're fully um, engaged in, into what's the into the job ahead essentially. So, and that, that's not easy to do as an athlete. You know that's that, that's that's probably the, the biggest that's probably the biggest skill like you know any athlete could could um could could have if if they wanted to if they could choose something is to actually get into their flow state consistently and know when and how to do that and um yeah from my experience Yuki and Daniel do that very very well. Yeah, I have to say like what's again very unique to this sport is like the sport specific intelligence they have. You know, it's not only about driving and, and executing the motor skills, pedaling and steering, but it's actually the processing the information, delivering and understanding what's going on and, and being able to adapt so quickly. So I would say like the adaptability, for example, it's something that is like if, if we know what's happening in the race, how the grip changes almost every lap and, and that information that they're able to gather and deliver and, and adjust for their driving. I think that's super impressive skill what they are doing consistently. So 
these are something like which impresses me and and how do they understand the tires how how do they how the sensor motoric ability for them to understand the car behavior how the rear moves how do they need to adjust them the steering patterns etc so th- i think that's something that sport specific intelligence super impressive mm. we've seen haven't we in recent weeks i think fernando in baku saw uh, an overtake, didn't he, for, from Lance or something on one, on one of the big screens and was able to talk on the radio about yeah. that. And it, you just think, how, you're driving a car at the speed you're driving the car at. How on earth can you process external information and also keep your eye on the road and, yeah. and be able to do everything in the cockpit? It's, it's yeah. remarkable stuff. Um, we've got a tweet from Claire who would like to know what the most exciting moment of your career has been. Michael, start with you. I mean, Daniel's got eight wins in Formula One. It doesn't have to be a win, but I guess maybe one of those wins might might be a highlight for you. Yeah, I I think, I mean, the obvious one is Monaco because he I think he I think he had a perfect weekend that that, that weekend. I think he went quickest in all practice sessions, quality and, and won. But the, the more I think about it, I'm probably going to say the Monza win. Um, and the reason for that is because there's a lot of adversity. Um, you know, Daniel was clearly struggling in in, in the McLaren and. He was, you know, similar to, you know, what Piru spoke about with with Pierre. He was going through, you know, quite a low in his career. It, it, to be honest, it probably was the first low of his career because since he came on as a junior, it, it was kind of just up, up, up. Um, and I think this was the first time where he was ex- actually ex- experiencing some difficulties. So, um, yeah, I, I think that win was was probably the most exciting to kind of see him just keep battling away and, Prove some doubt, doubt is wrong. Um, that was that. That felt like a really fulfilling weekend, and he was good. He was good all weekend that weekend as well. He was good in the sprint, um, which then put him on. I think he put him on front row. Yeah, put him on front row for the race. So yeah, I'll, I'll say I'll say Monza. Perry, I was going to suggest that yours might also be based at Monza as well. Oh yeah, it, it is. I would say it's top two, but I would say even the Brazil the year before. You know, we had the Red Bull year. And then, then we went back to, you know, Toro, um, Toroso. And, and then remembering the, the last corner, Luis chasing Pierre. And, and they were side by side to the finishing line and, and Pierre finishing P2. This was pretty, this was really sentimental moment, I would say, for his career. And, 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 and this kind of had a big booster for his self-belief and, and, and you know, for his career itself and, and that I have to say this this moment still gives me goosebumps you know because you could almost write the book from that year itself and, and this is something that kind of captures the, the moment itself. What did you did you notice much of a change in him after that result? It was I have to say I always say that it was not only those two three races where he scored podium because there was also many other races that we could have been on a podium or could have scored a good result. It was just always doing our part and, and doing the best we can and be there where the opportunity is. And, and those moments just kind of came together. So it was just maybe a confirmation, let's say, you know, we can. Lena on Twitter would like to know, and this, Michael, is, is probably probably to start with you. What are, the, what are the biggest challenges of switching teams as a performance coach? You alluded to it earlier that you've done a bit of hopping between, between them in, in recent years. Um, what, what are the biggest challenges? Yeah, I, I think the biggest challenge is, is the unknown of the car, um, especially for, for, for your driver. You know, you, they're, they're jumping into a completely different car. So you don't really know how things are going to go. Um, you know the obvious stuff. You know new staffs so understanding their processes and how they operate, and building that report again, right? Because I think people looking from the outside in, maybe they don't quite understand, like, understand how much of a team sport it is. I know. I know when the race goes on, it's like yes, there's an athlete in, in the cockpit and there's one other person talking to him, but it, it, it's a very, very team orientated sport. So, yeah, uh, building building report. With you know the with everyone essentially and understanding their procedures and how things operate, like most of it's the same, but it is a little bit different um, from from um, from team to team. Um, so, yeah, I think just familiarising yourself with with I guess their procedures, and then that's pretty much it. Besides that, you're wearing different team shirt color, and you're you're still in the garage, and everyone's there trying to trying to win a race. So, 
uh, yeah, I, I think the obvious thing is just trying to get your athlete up to speed with everything and, and trying to get him to adapt to, to the car as best as possible. And that's always the most probably nervous thing, I think, you know, because you can always prepare. And your preseason preparation doesn't really change much from team to team. But, uh, like, you know, as Piri was talking about how, like, you know, things change so much in the car, whether it's the feel of the car, where it's the tyres, you know, all, all this completely changes when you jump into a new car. So that's probably the most challenging thing is just like, I guess just waiting helplessly, just making sure like to see how, how your driver goes in a new car. And yeah, like in, in the Renault, it was quite seamless, but unfortunately in the, in the McLaren, it was, it was quite difficult. Yeah. So much yeah. out of your control there, isn't that? Yeah. I would say like you would really divide it into, you know, like I said, there's again, there's so many stakeholders in place. And, and finding that sweet spot on that working relationship, you know, that always takes time. Like Michael said, there's so, so, it's a team sport and there's so many different people that has an impact to the end result. So finding that sweet spot on that working relationship always takes time. It's, it's the same for, for, for everybody when they go to a new, new workplace. It always takes time that, that you kind of optimize, you know, the, the efficiency. And, and then it's a completely different scenario is then the car itself, you know, like not every car behaves the same, the, the, the mechanical um, kinematics, kinetics the, itself, the way you drive, the functionalities, these are different stories. And, and, and we can see that that some people are just quicker than others. And it's not only because it's drivers, it is also like because the cars are just different. And, and, and I'm not envious for drivers at, at all because you know it's not an easy task it looks so obvious from the outside that when someone is struggling but but people that are inside they know how complex it is and then it really really takes time and maybe someone sometimes someone never gets there really and mm. and, that, and it's not that they are bad drivers or or it's just you know it's just a difficult puzzle to put together you have to be so good to get into Formula One. You, you know, it, it's, even if you're struggling in Formula One, you are still one of the top drivers in the entire world. And I think that's what maybe some some people forget is that actually these guys are the cream of the crop. And yeah, you know, it's it's a tough tough role. You know, it's been a, again a good good reminder for me uh, this year working with the with the third rookie you now is that what's the learning aching it is when when a new driver comes to the sport how difficult it is to adjust you know this year we got one and a half day of testing before before the season start and then you're expected to fight for the against the best you know like it's a really 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 difficult sport to come in and 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 you really have to be good to get on top on top on this this sport and and like i said again I've done it now three times and, and I always remember every single time how difficult it is. But it's been, again, like a, a good reminder, like it's really, really tricky. And, and people who knows what's going behind the scenes, they know how complex and difficult it is actually get up to speed in this sport because you really have no time. Becoming a bit of a rookie specialist, Perry. <laughs> You're the go-to <laughs> man for, for rookies in, in Formula One. Um, Michael, take us through the the physical demands placed on a driver throughout throughout a race, and and how do you train for that process and, and what goes on to, to their bodies? Yeah, like I think the, the obvious one, G force. Um, so a lot of the G force is placed predominantly on their on their neck. Um, you also have like the heat, so the heat stresses on the body. So they're obviously in, in a cockpit, and they're wearing fire resistant suits. So on on hot days, when they're in the cockpit, they've got the engine behind them. They're in fire resistant suit. They've got the the hot rubber tires around them. They've got this, so they've almost got this this massive bubble of heat I guess, around them, and they and then they can't their body. Um, I guess has difficulty uh, cooling down because they're in this fire resistant suit, which isn't ventilated, right? So you've got that, you've got that physical demand and you've also got like the vibrations of the car, which is another physical demand. So, you know, they're, they're fighting the car consistently, you know, through, through, through turning and braking and cornering. So th those are probably the, the three biggest, like, like physical um, attributes of, of what I guess the, 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 the athletes um, endure over, over a race. <laughs> How we how we train for that? I'm sure every every coach has got their their methods, but essentially, you know, training the neck is 100% pre 
probably the most important reason for it is if if um, if the drive you could almost imagine like if you're driving a car. Um, I probably shouldn't say try this at home, but if you obviously tilt your head whilst driving, your eye line is skewed, and then you know, so your 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 perception changes, your judgment changes, and also um, I guess your your judgment of of the actual the, the, your your eye line and your race line can change. So trying to keep your head as neutral as possible is is very important when when racing, and part of that is having good neck strength because these guys are they're enduring some pretty pretty high G's um, throughout the, throughout the season. Um, especially because these cars are getting quicker. So, you know, as the cars get quicker and quicker, they are generally experiencing more G-force. And, you know, so some high-speed corners, you know, they can get up to 5G, which is which is crazy amounts. So which it's, it's almost essentially, you could almost be saying it's about 35 kilos worth of force placed on their neck, you know. So that's so, so it's the neck's a big one. And I like to focus quite a lot on the posterior chain to the back of the body. Um, so the calves, hamstrings, glutes, and lower back, um, ma- mainly because of, like, through the braking when you know people probably don't realize but the, the braking force is is, is, a, is a lot so these guys are slamming the brakes quite heavily so a lot of force has goes into their to, to braking um so when so when they are breaking the car down so fast a lot of the force is is being endured through their calves hamstrings and glutes and then through cornering they're also using their hips to feel the car so it's quite quite a lot of load going through their glutes and and lower back so that they're probably the, the main areas of focus, um, but that's not like that's not the Bible. Um, and I'll give you an example because, like th- this year, Yuki has struggled a lot with his upper body strength. So um, I've focused quite a lot on, on uh, Yuki's upper body conditioning this year, a lot more than what I previously have with Daniel because Daniel already had that conditioning um, naturally. Or you could probably say because of his training age, Daniel has just had a lot more pre-seasons and, and been in the sport a lot more. So, uh, yeah, I wouldn't say that's like how I train every driver. It obviously depends on your driver's profile and what they need. But, yeah, that pretty much sums up what I kind of like focus on. It's a difficult and unique sport because you can't really see the human moment because you're inside a cockpit. So you can't really see the stresses on the body. Secondly, like what's the difference is like in running or whatever, you're internally producing the forces. So you're planting the, the face, the crown, and you you personally producing the forces in in formula one you have a lot of resisting forces so rather than internally producing you're externally resisting so the the concept is very different and and that's makes it very unique to other sports or all and and you know like even the breathing pattern while they driving is like when they go through barcelona it's like two-thirds of the lap they they don't breathe because they're holding their breath when they're contracting in the car and cockpit and not only is the stress while they're driving is, but but understanding the external stress that that this sport causes, which comes through traveling and external commitments. So I always say that there's internal and external stressors in these sports, and and going through the year requires some serious resilience, body resilience, because it's it's not only what's happening in the car; it's also what's happening outside the car. Mm. And and I would say this really requires some serious body resilience. I've got a tweet here from Zienta who would like to know how do you help the drivers deal with the mental aspect of of F one and Piri. I mean, yeah, how do how do you help drivers get over bad results? Because obviously you've got the physical side, but I'm guessing there is a there is a balance right between the physical and the mental side of the yes. sport. So I have to say that at very very early years, I already started working with a sports psychologist because whether it was directly with with the driver or indirectly through me uh, but I, I i i found enormous help with with having someone on my side going through the different processes going through different targets um understanding what's going on what are the focus points and being a sounding board and 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 it's not about treating an issue it's, it's really like mentoring and being the sounding board there for for the moments during the highs and during the lows. And those both aspects, highs and lows, are the part of the process. So so I always have had someone on my side helping me in the coaching process, whether it was directly with the with an athlete or, or indirectly. And and for me that has been a super essential part of the my coaching approach. Michael, it's a bit of a cliche, isn't it? Don't work with your friends. Don't go into business with your friends. Uh, and obviously, you, you were friends with Daniel before you started that working relationship. So how did you adapt to having to ultimately, you know, 
when it, when it was business time, you really had to knuckle down as a pair, didn't you, and, and work hard? Yeah, that, that was something that I brought up initially in our first ever chat when he wanted, to, you know, when Daniel wanted me on board was I said to him, I said, look, you know, that I'm happy to come on board, but, you know, you, you're going to have to put trust in me as a coach. Like there's that natural trust as a friend, but truth is I don't want to just be part of your entourage. Like I want to come on board and, and make a difference. Um, I don't want to be, be that guy that's in the paddock just to be a friend. So uh, that was something he agreed on, he agreed on. And I said, look, when I put my coaching hat on, you need to respect that and, and you need to listen. And then obviously there'll be times where, you know, I, I put my friend hat on and we're, we're mates. And uh, yeah, surprisingly, Matt, that kind of that, that kind of like happened quite naturally. I, I think uh, maybe my body language and my tone of voice when I when I need to be a coach kind of changes a little bit and uh, and the language that I use. So maybe Daniel could really pick that up quite naturally. But, oh, OK, hang on a second. He's being a coach here. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. So that 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 transition actually happened quite naturally and quite easily. I, I thought I thought it'd be a bit of a struggle at the start, him getting getting me when I'm a coach and and whatnot but uh no that that kind of was a bit seamless so that was uh yeah quite quite lucky on my side i want to start talking about nutrition and food and, and what what f1 drivers eat and you mentioned the the g-forces going going around and i imagine that's not something you want to be doing is eating directly before you get in a formula one car but michael i guess you yuki well i was i was looking i was looking at some quotes on food by yuki and these i think this was at the start of the 2022 season where he said he was getting takeaway for breakfast lunch and dinner and i'm gonna guess that's not happening anymore since you've uh, started working with him or what you know how how has his nutrition changed and what are you trying to get your your drivers to eat before and during races yeah i i mean like i said earlier i think as yuki goes through you know year by year he's you know, becoming a lot more mature and understanding what what's required from the one. You know, whether it's training or eating well. So, uh, all, all credit to Red Bull. You know, we, we go to the the Red Bull Athletic Athletic Performance Center in, in Austria every year, and they've got a they got a sports dietitian there. So we get quite a lot of help when it comes to like uh, our hydration protocol and and you know the type of foods that we should be eating. But uh, Yuki has reminded me of uh, how fast um, a male's metabolism can be at 22. He eats like a horse. Um, Piri's, pro- <laughs> Piri's probably seen the, the portions yes. firsthand. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> but no, look, I, I, like as, as a rough as a rough example, um, you know, in the mornings we'd probably have like an eggs Benedict. So just having you know, two poached eggs on, on on like some multi-grain muffins with. Um, with some hollandaise sauce and sometimes he has like a he has smoked salmon on it as well and then usually lunchtime we might have some like beef tacos you know and, and smash the tacos with some vegetables and, and some some healthy fats like avocado but but yeah as you said matt we, we probably wouldn't ideally want to eat um within a two-hour window of, of jumping in the car so yeah so if he's having if he's having lunch at one it's because his next session is either at three or four and then at at night is generally a more carbohydrate dense meal so um, we'll still have our elements of protein but it'll be probably a portion of two to one to carb so like a seafood pasta so we might have some prawns um in in, in some shrimps in, in in a big seafood pasta for for yuki so that's probably like a like a nice little rough day of of what yuki eats and um yeah and then probably in between maybe as a snack he'll have some yogurt with some with some raw honey and some berries so yeah, we've we've got him eating well. Uh, he's leaning up, and he's 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 getting some compliments from some other drivers, which is making him happy. So uh, he's finally realised that <laughs> eating, eating well helps. Yeah, yeah, very very healthy indeed. Perry, what about the? I mean, you mentioned you know obviously we've got Austria this week, and you got the schedule. Was it last week? You got the schedule for this week. So are you Actually, how yesterday. strictly? Oh, yesterday. Apologies. Yeah. So you got the schedule yesterday. So are you now. Is part of your job kind of going through that schedule and trying to work out things like food and, and when is a good time to eat? But then more broadly, what else are you putting into into next schedule? So it's it's because this schedule is actually already full. So it's more of of, of going through and and optimizing it. Like they have they have they are shoot, in the shooting with Red Bull tomorrow. Um, the, the track activity starts on Thursday. It's it's engineering meetings. It's media. So it's already packed. It's, so it's more like overviewing and and making sure that we we are optimizing the, the available time we have. And then we try to, if there is free slots, 
what are we doing? Is it is it recovery or are we doing something that that actually putting some training in in? So for example, tomorrow tomorrow is going to look like they're going to do shooting in Salzburg. Um, afternoon we're going to do a, a preparation session for for the weekend, and then we're going to have a dinner Thursday. We we hit the track um, track walk, engineering meetings, media, and and then we have. Then, then quick therapy session, and then we are pretty much ready to jump in the car. Wow, it's a, it's a lot. It's a lot going on, Michael. Do you do you find that perhaps some sometimes it's like over scheduled? You know, it, it really feels like. I guess it has to be. But for a Formula One driver, there really nothing is left to chance, is it? Everything has to be planned to to a T. Yeah, that's probably our biggest challenge, and, and probably my biggest pet hate of Formula One is just seeing how much how how the I guess how busy their schedules are across a race weekend like if you look at any other athlete whether it's a basketball or footballer if you ask them what they do on their match day <laughs> they'll tell you they wake up <laughs> at eight nine o'clock and they'll just literally stroll themselves into the stadium and they've got three hours to prepare where for us on a sunday it's we get to the track and honestly i i only see yuki for 45 minutes before the race and that's to prepare and, and set up yeah. but besides that he's in engineering meetings he's got meet and greets he may have to do fan zone he may have to do a paddock club appearance so and so i'm just making sure that okay everything's set up ready to go so as soon as he walks into this in this racing room we're ready to warm up because we've only got 45 minutes so it is a very big struggle for us as coaches because we are very limited on what we can do on a race weekend because their schedules are so 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 condensed and packed so yeah, from my side, it's like just making sure everything goes smooth so that way you can finish a day and just get quality sleep um, because mostly from from Thursday onwards, there's, there's no time to train and, and to be fair, you're not going to gain anything by training um, in those days anyway. So, yeah. yeah, it's just about sleep quality, recovery, trying to fit in a, a you know, massage where you can and just keep it, keeping the headspace good, right? So, you know, sometimes mm-hmm. they are a little bit frustrated Sorry. because they've had, long, they've had long Thursdays, you know, eight hours of media, they're uh, they're mentally exhausted, so you're just trying to, yeah, keep 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 them in the right head zone. Perry, we're we're used to probably seeing you guys the most on the grid before before a race. I think that's traditionally when we see you know the balls dropping with Pierre and the reactions and, and all that sort of stuff. So, what is that period of time like? Just pre race, you're on the grid. Try and describe what you, what you're what you're up to and what what you're doing there. So I would say I would call it, it it's it's about arousal management. So so you know, and every single individual is a little bit different. Someone is really neurally driven already, and they are super pumped up. So you don't need to pump pump up them more. Some other one is like a little bit more sluggish and more laid back. So you can need to lift it up a little bit. So so you always try to learn with your with your athlete that where where, where is their optimum sweet spot how to get them in the right mind space that they, they feel sharp but not overly arousal which make them more nervous and and more prone to mistakes um so that's always a learning curve with your own driver and 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 for us with pierre for example we we had these few triggers we had the music playlist which was playing on sunday so this was a sign that today's a today's a race day then we had these few drills with we, what we did before the race. So these were just triggers telling to the mind that, that okay, today is a game day. Um, and, and I always say, like, you you don't need to do a big pep talk on, on Sunday anymore. You know, you've done leading up to the preparation. They, they, they have so many information they receive from in, uh, engineers. So you, you just have these few signs which is whether it's a music or something else, or it's a f- get, um, game day food or whatever. These are just like the triggers to, to put them in the right mind space. And for us, one one of them was the, the, the ball drill that Pierre is still doing. Talk us through that. How did that come about? What what, what was the what was the purpose of it? This was really just like a switch on button. It, it was not like, okay, this ball drill will make him drive faster. It was just a really for this arousal management it was just like a switch on button that okay now it's time to 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 hit the track yeah mm-hmm. it was it was really just like uh, it it was more for the mind and that 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 it that now is a game time well it's it, we, we see it a lot and it, and it you know that i think probably even viewers at home when they see it that like, oh good you know goodness me we're we're pretty close to lights out i think it gets people at home quite excited <laughs> um michael we, we we've got 
some, shall we say, older drivers now in Formula One. We've got Fernando Alonso at the age of 41. We've got Lewis at 38. Uh, what are the challenges with aging? I'm going to put them in inverted commas because I'll definitely get in trouble if I say that they're old. But what, <laughs> what, what are the challenges with, with, with those guys as they get older? And, you know, I mean, how old could you realistically race into Formula One, do you think? Oh, well, I, I think just biologically is, is probably the main challenge. You know, it's a, I think once you hit 30, your testosterone starts to naturally decline, um, same as your eyesight. So, you know, when uh, I, I think as you get older, you know, even re- recovery, you know, you, you have slower recovery. So I think when you get like past your 30s, it's almost like rather than training harder, you need to train smarter. And um, that's probably something that Lewis and and Fernando are doing is you know training smarter. Um, they probably obviously they obviously know their body very very well. You know they've had that many that many years of pre seasons. They they probably understand what they what's required and what they need. But I think yeah I think I think just biologically is probably the biggest challenge as you get older. Right, you just naturally um, your you, you know your your peak performance will just naturally decline just based on you know your human biology and, and what your body can and can't do as they get as it gets older. How old can you drive to? I mean, how long's a piece of string, Matt? Um, I think the way the way those two guys are driving, uh, <laughs> they got plenty more years in them. They're they're driving phenomenal, right? Um, yeah. I don't yeah. think I can I don't think I can answer that question. But you know what? I always like to be proven wrong. So I'm going to say, I, I'm going to say, look, for, 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 I, I'd be very surprised if I see anyone past past forty three. To, to keep going but uh, I want I want to be proven wrong right that's that's the whole point of, uh, of sports performance <laughs> yeah. I want to I want to see someone prove me wrong Fernando yeah. world champion at 44 there you go oh. yeah, I think I think I think the second aspect is actually really the motivation you know you know how how taxing one year of driving a Formula One as a circus all year round and, and what it takes it, it's a natural like do you have it do you have it in you to put the work and the effort for getting ready getting through getting through all the jet lags doing the work with the engineers do you i think this is the second very crucial aspect that how is your motivation holding on to put that effort what it requires it's same for us you know like when we look at our well-being and, and health and, and and fitness it's it's a lot driven by on our own you know motivation because it's not getting it doesn't feel like it's getting any easier so it feels like you really need that that mental edge to to put that effort and and be the discipline and putting the effort and hopefully we will see a 45 year old world champion in Formula One and we broke Michael wrong. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll, probably, I'll probably also add, I think as you get older, your priorities change too, right? Which is probably why, you know, you don't yes. usually see that many yeah. older drivers is because what I've noticed, Matt, is rookies coming in, they got a point to prove and their, their fear factor and risk factor is probably uh, non-existent, you know, because they've just got, they got mm. so much to prove um, I've seen in, uh, you know, from what I noticed, the younger guys is like you don't see much fear or, or risk factor, or they just their 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 fear senses and risk senses aren't really as heightened as compared to as you get older, as you mature, you know. Especially when you look at when you as you get older, you start having a family, then you start to weigh up the risk, right? You start to weigh up the risk of of driving, and um, you know, you, you you look at someone like Kimi and Seb, it's like, oh, what were they? You know, that's is it, were they risking a lot more? when they were 20 than what they were at 40, you could probably say, yes, right. They got a family, they got a family. Um, and you probably start to look at life a little bit differently when you're in your, th- when you're in your 30s and your 40s mm-hmm. and time's not really on your side. And, you know, you, if, if you're still in, if you're still 40 when you're in Formula One, you've obviously made a lot of money too, right? So it's kind of like, well, do I need to keep making, do I need, do I need to keep taking the risk? You know, because I am, you know, technically you're financially, you technically have financial freedom, right? So, and you probably have a loving family. So, yeah, I, I think your priorities change as well as you get older. So that's equally more impressive if you're still still racing at forty. And as Piri, as Piri said, you still have the motivation, you still have the performance factor, and your priorities still in check. And you know, you, you when you're young, you, you don't even know what you don't know. You just you just go for it, and and you know, that's that's a your blessing as and as as your curse as well. You know, when you're young you don't you don't really because you don't know what to fear for you just go for it and when you get 
more aware, more conscious. That's when you start, you know, putting the priorities like what's important, where my where's my limit, etc. So that's where you start scaling things differently. Got one final question for both of you. We both know that you're kind of, you know, you're super professional in your jobs, but you must have made an error or two along the way. And I'm just fascinated because you work so closely with the drivers. I'm fascinated. Michael, you're laughing, so I'm going to start with you because there must there must be a story or two about something you didn't do or did do that, that has led to something happening. Yeah, okay. One is pretty bad and actually happened to this year, race one. Um, but I'll tell you one Daniel and one Yuki story. So Daniel's story, not that bad, but heading into um, heading into the race, you know, went to suit up and he's in the car and the engineers obviously said, all right, cool, you know, um, let's go. So Daniel's got to put his, his gloves on and I accidentally gave him two left-hand gloves. So uh, he's, <laughs> flat, he's flapping. <laughs> well, he's, he's, got his hel- he's got his helmet on, so I can't hear what he's saying. He's just flapping his, his glove at me and I'm like, What's he doing? Like, he's fluffing his glove at me, and I figured out that I gave him two left hand gloves. Um, and the second one, which is terrible, like when I say terrible, just a, a bad, a bad error on my side, freak accident. But our first race of the year, Bahrain. I'm so excited. I'm with Yuki. You know, first race together. We've gone out in Bahrain on the grass to do some mobility um, before Friday, before P1, uh, before heading to the track. And he's 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 warming up. I don't know if Piro knows this one, but um. And just as a little bit of banter, Yuki like was on the was on the foam roll, and he like I have a little golf ball that we use to, to release our feet, um, to release like the, the the outside of your feet. He threw it at me, and I like, hit the back of my leg, and I was like, oh, okay, you know, you want to banter? So I like I picked it up, and I just like blindly like just threw it over my shoulder because I knew he was like sitting there, and it, I, I know word of a lie, it hit him straight in the eye, and he's just, oh, oh, no. and he's just ro- he's rolling over in agony, and I've just had a heart attack. <laughs> And it's just welted. <laughs> it's, it's instantly welted up. So I've like I've run to the bar and I've just asked for some ice. And I've just ice. I'm icing his eye for two hours. I've called the doctor. I was like, we need eye drops. Here I am thinking, oh no, my first <laughs> my first race with Yuki, and he's not going to go into practice. It was a it was a very stressful <laughs> Friday. <laughs> oh my goodness imagine yeah. that Yuki Tsunoda the first practice session of, of the season and he's out because his, his trainer threw an eye <laughs> yeah. threw a golf ball in his eye oh what, what a brilliant story uh, Piri what about you I think I have one from the early years we, we were flying to Australia and I was checking in and I realised because I was in charge of our flights and I realised our flight was yesterday not today oh. so this is embarrassing <laughs> <laughs> a second time you know when pierre won in monza i remember the crit it was a mess you know nothing was working something was missing something didn't work on a, on a car or like it was just a full mess nothing was working and and at the end of the day we were at the <laughs> we won the race so this was a fun funny memory that like nothing went on plan on that particular yeah. day on a crit but but luckily the, the the end of the day was pretty good one <laughs> well there you go <laughs> um brilliant stuff guys thank you so much for your time it's been a fascinating chat i think uh yeah learned an awful lot about what what you guys do but as i said at the start you know what what the drivers have to go through as well so i think it helps us to understand that so yeah really appreciate your time thank you so much um and we, we will be back next tuesday uh, after the austrian grand prix to look back at that so i uh, hope you can join us then bye for now 